Hello, to introduce myself, I'm Bill Risbridger, uh, and I'm the uh, team leader on the Viking Restoration. Uh, as Gerald pointed out, I've been working on this aircraft, I think, for 25 years now. I was expecting him to ask me, well, why the bloody hell haven't you finished it yet? <laughs> <laughs> as That's you know, afterwards. these things take time. <laughs> so, uh, Viking. Um, firstly, let me just introduce uh, the team, as they stand at the moment, who are sitting in this uh, front table here. We've got uh, Phil, Peter, Martin, John and Nick. Uh, we've got one other team member who's in Las Vegas at the moment and for some reason he didn't want to come back and join us on this day. But uh, yeah, they're my team and I'm very, very grateful to them and, and together um, we'll show you hopefully what we've achieved. Um, so this is what I intend to cover today. Uh, I'm going to keep this 20, 30 minutes hopefully. Uh, give you a bit of information about the Viking, the history of the Viking, the development. Other, other, in fact, although Tammany said it's the last one, it's the last one in the UK, but there are actually six left in the world. Uh, hopefully soon to be two, though, in the UK, because there's another one due to be brought back to Blackbush from Vienna next month, hopefully. Uh, then we'll talk about our particular Viking and how it got to be here, and uh, the restoration work um, that, we, that we've been doing it. I can't cover, obviously, 20 years in a half-hour talk, so I'll pick out certain aspects of the restoration and talk about those. And then, uh, from this year onwards, we're now looking to move into the uh, interior of the aircraft, and we'll talk about the plans that we, that we have for that. So, moving on, uh, that's the team, uh, photo taken last year. Uh, these are the seats that Sir Gerald mentioned that the Finnis family have uh, paid for and we're, we're very, very grateful. There is actually still a little bit of money left over in the pot and uh, we've got some plans for that and I'll come on to that uh, a bit later. So, the Viking. Um, Vickers, looking forward, back in 1944, started thinking about the end of the war and they started thinking, what should we do when nobody wants our military aircraft anymore? Because as you all know, during the war, that's all they did was military aircraft. So they started to think about civil aircraft uh, at the end of the war. Now, they even then, you had the Brabazon Committee, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, that were looking on behalf of the UK as to what sort of aircraft, particularly passenger aircraft, should we be producing from the 1950s onwards. Uh, the Viking wasn't part of the Brabazon Committee. Uh, however, the Viscount was. Um, and, and, and Vickers were doing some very, very early work on the Viscount. However, the, Vickers knew that the Viscount wasn't going to be ready uh, by the end of the war, and they needed what was known as an interim aircraft, something that they could produce fairly quickly, using a lot of parts that they already had, uh, and something that they could get on the market very quickly. And obviously, something to keep the factory going, and to keep the people in work, and keep production rolling. So, they came up with the Viking. They actually looked across three aircraft. We had the Warwick the Warwick Continental, the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the Wellington, um, and what, the third one was the Windsor. Um, for those who don't know the Warwick and the Windsor, they were sort of developments of the, of the Wellington. Uh, they had actually played around with uh, producing civil versions of those, but they never really went anywhere. So looking at those three aircraft, they decided probably the Viking, uh, sorry, the Wellington was probably the most suitable aircraft to adapt into a civil aircraft. So in fact, in its early, um, early progress, its early days, it was known as the, the, the Wellington Civil or the Wellington, Wellington Commercial. And later on it became known as the Viking or the VC-1, uh, the very first, and of course we ended up with the VC-10 that we all know about. Um, the original thoughts were it was going to be very much based on the Wellington, but as, as development went on, they'd moved away from the Wellington to an, ex to, to an extent. However, it did have Wellington wings, Wellington engines, Wellington undercarriage, and the tail unit was mainly taken from a Warwick. Uh, interestingly, the, the wings on the aircraft, when first produced, were fabric covered uh, and geodetic in exactly the same way as the Wellington. Uh, and I'll, but I'll come on to that. So the first 19 of the 163 Vikings built had fabric-covered wings and fabric-covered uh, tail surfaces on the, particularly on the tailplane and on the rudder, on the elevators, etc. Um, I think I've not covered there. So there's a stopgap aircraft. The other interesting thing was this was the, really the first time that Vickers had seriously considered going into commercial aircraft. 
before the war and really from 1908 onwards, they had built in the main military aircraft. They dabbled in civil aircraft, but not to any great extent. And although they, although they produced some civil aircraft in the 1930s, they were very, very short production runs, literally just a handful. So this was their first serious move into, into civil aviation. Um, so, as you all probably know, if you've got my sort of background and you know something about aircraft, the Wellington was a, a geodetic structure. Does anybody here need a, a geodetic structure explained to them? Uh, essentially, it's, it's like a diamond shaped metal that, that crosses over each other. Quite a complex thing to, to, to manufacture. Uh, developed by Barnes Wallace, originally for the R100 airship. Um, but, but Vickers knew that the geodetic structure wasn't going to be suitable for the fuselage of the, uh, the Vikings, so they, they built a, a more modern stress skin uh, construction. However, as I've already said, they decided they were going to stick with the, the Wellington wings and the geodetic structure there. So it had um, some innovations for the day. They uh, decided that they were going to put soundproofing in, though it was still incredibly noisy when you flew in it, uh, and um, thermal insulation. It had uh, temperature controls, very rudimentary. It was still very, very cold when you flew in it, and the, the steward would give you a blanket, uh, particularly if you were flying through mountains or somewhere cold. It had ventilation. Uh, it had lighting fixed into the seats. These were all fairly new developments. Uh, it was, however, an unpressurised cabin. Um, as again, I say, it was a stopgap aircraft. Building a pressurised fuselage would have been a lot of work, so they went with an unpressurised cabin. And you can always tell an unpressurised cabin on an aircraft because it's got square windows. You don't have square windows on a, on a pressurised cabin because it has a, it, you've got an inbuilt weakness then in the fuselage, as, as de Havilland found out later on when they built the Comet. Um, Rolls-Royce Lean Jet Engines, I'll come to, back to that shortly. Uh, as I said, there was 163 Vikings built between 1946 and 1949. Uh, in addition, I should mention very quickly the Valletta. The Valletta was the military version of the Viking, and they built 263 of those, and they were into production in, until the early 50s. Very, very similar to the Viking, with some uh, additional strength and flaws, bigger doors, uh, pat more powerful engines, etc. And the Viking soldiered on, it was a good old aircraft, it was robust, it kept going, and um, a lot of um, um, charter airlines kept it going. I think the last one in service was 1967, before the, the very last one was retired. Right, it was for its day a, a, a medium-sized aircraft, it had three crew, two pilots and a radio operator, uh, a reasonably big cockpit, even by today's standards, a reasonably big cockpit. Uh, one steward, no stewardesses in those days, not, well, not for BEA anyway, uh, and 21 passengers. Um, it was actually quite a comfortable aircraft to fly in. Uh, 21 seats, you had plenty of room, it effectively was all first class all the way through. Um, and two cabins, divided by the wing spar, which I'll come back to. Um, so you had 15 that sat in the rear cabin and, and 6 in the forward cabin. Um, I won't go through into too much details about the dimensions. Hercules engines, which was a tried and trusted engine and been used on the Wellington, been developed before the First World War. Maximum speed of 210 mile an hour, they cruised at round about 190 miles an hour. Service ceiling of 22,500 feet, it never flew at that height because the passengers would have been gasping for breath if they had have done. So its sort of maximum usual in-service height was about 15,000 feet uh, and often flew 9 or 10,000 feet. There was an old pilot here, who was, Roger, he was on your team, he uh, died a couple of years ago, what was his name? Oh, that's yes, he, he was telling me about flying certainly the DC-3 and he said with, with an aircraft like this, when you flew over something like the Pyrenees, you couldn't fly over the Pyrenees, it was too high. So they used to wind their way through the mountains because you just couldn't get the altitude, and that would have been the same with the Viking. Um, so it probably would have been an interesting flight. Uh, and range of about 1,500 miles, so it was designed to be used domestically and on European routes. Though there were some charter airlines, and there was one in particular that flew it down to South Africa and back with, with a lot of stops on the way for refuelling, etc. So, our particular Viking, GAGRU, it's actually a very early Viking. It was number 12 off the production line, uh, built in 1946. Um, 
The first 19 built had the fabric covered wings and the geodetic wings. Our, our aircraft went to BEA. BEA didn't like fabric covering, so within a year it came back to the factory and uh, they took off the, the Wellington wings and they put new, more traditional wings on stress skin wings. Uh, and that's how it flew for the rest of its career. Named Vagrant, BEA in those, do, in those days used to name all their aircraft and they had 80 of these eventually and they really struggled to find 80 names to give to their aircraft that began with a V and you came up with some quite incredible names. Um, now BEA only actually had our particular aircraft for a short while as you can see from May 46 to February 47. Uh, they then leased it to Air Lingus who used it for crew training because Air Lingus uh, had in the meantime ordered their own Vikings. Air Lingus just incidentally didn't like the Viking and they, they got rid of them very quickly. Um, so in 1947, BEA decided to get rid of our particular Viking and they sold it to British South American Airways who kept it in storage for a while. They sent it back to Vickers to have the wings uh, replaced uh, and then they allocated it to British West Indian Airways who at that time were owned by British South American Airways. And so it moved down to Tr Trinidad, where it was based, and it remained there until 1954. And it, it was given the name Barbados then. Probably a nicer name than Vagrant. Um, from 54, well, 55 up to 59, it was leased to the Kuwaiti Oil Company, uh, and so it was based in the Persian Gulf. Uh, it had at least one accident while it was operated out there. It was damaged, but uh, they were able to repair it. Basra in 55 was the uh, accident. 1959, it was bought by East Anglian Flying Services, who were the owners of Channel Airways Limited. So they again stored it for a while at South End before allocating it to Channel Airways, and it flew just for one year uh, in Channel Airways colours. Interestingly, and I'll come on to this later, we paint stripped the aircraft uh, at Brooklands, and as we were taking off the various layers of paint, we, we discovered the Channel Airways livery still underneath. In 1964, it went over to Holland uh, to become a roadside cafe. I don't know how it got there, but the owner of the, the cafe bought three Vikings, uh, and he had them all uh, laid out in a triangular pattern by the side of a busy road in a place called Susterberg in, in Holland. And um, he put the rear up so that they were level, because it's, it's a tail wheel aircraft, as you know. And which was a great thing because the aircraft would have been scrapped. The only downside was he stripped everything out, unfortunately. So there were, you know, literally, so he could get as many table and chairs in. Um, when we first started the restoration, particularly when we were working in the hold, I cannot tell you how many sachets of brown sauce and ketchup we recovered from the aircraft. <laughs> it was uh, a knives, forks, all sorts of debris left over from its days as a, a cafe. Uh, I've got some pictures of that later on uh, when it was parked up. 1979, at that time British Airways owned uh, a collection of historic aircraft which they kept at Cosford uh, and BA decided to buy this aircraft and add it to their historic collection. So in 79, BA bought the aircraft back to the UK and it went uh, to Cosford and I've got some pictures of that later where it was put on display. They painted it in the wrong colour scheme. Uh, it was a BA colour scheme, but it wasn't an accurate colour scheme. And there it remained until 1991, when BA decided, for a reason I'm not sure of, to, to, to lend or, or, or to supply the aircraft to Brooklyn. So it came here in Brooklyn. Now, I wasn't part of the team at that time, and there are other people probably in this room who know more than I do about how the aircraft was actually brought down to Brooklyn. I know it was taken apart and put on a low loader, and it was bought here and then reassembled. I wasn't involved in that, and I can't talk too much about that. Um, then in 97, um, I joined the Viking team along with two others, uh, and, and we started the restoration. Uh, in 2005, BA, unfortunately, decided to get rid of their historic collection. I say unfortunately because most of the aircraft were then broken up at Cosford. Luckily, the Viking wasn't. Uh, it was here already, and, and, and it was donated to Brooklands, and we've owned it ever since. One of the great things about the Viking is it's, it's like a Meccano kit. You can take it apart. So uh, in terms of preserving them, that's good because you can take it apart. You can put it on a lorry, and you can, you can move it somewhere. So it's currently the only surviving U uh, Viking in the UK, although we hope that there will be, a, will be another one in the next couple of months that is going from Vienna to Blackbush. Um, 
not in such a good condition as ours, but there is a team that's been put together there that hope to restore it, and, and we talk to them regularly at the moment. Right, so going back to uh, AGRU, this is a photograph of it in its very early days, in its very original livery, and that's the livery that we're going to put it back into, hopefully by um, early this summer. Uh, it will be put back in that livery. Anyone who knows our Viking at the moment will see it's just plain silver out there at the moment. When Tamily says it's complete on the outside, that's more or less correct. Uh, we've got to put the livery on, there's a couple of little bits to do, but, it, but it's largely there. But of course, as anyone involved in looking after an aircraft, particularly when it's stored outside, will know it's, it's an ongoing thing and, 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 and stuff that we did 20 years ago now needs redoing and, um, and looking at again. So. It's a restoration, frankly, that will probably never end. You know, there's always something that needs doing. But, however, we're hoping by the summer that's what it's going to look like. Um, I've just got a series of pictures here that just show AGRU in all its various liveries. So I mentioned earlier it went out to British West Indian Airways, and this is it parked up somewhere uh, in the Caribbean. I'm not sure where. And this is it when it belonged to the Kuwaiti Oil Company taken somewhere in England, don't know where that photo was taken though. And then it ended up in, with Channel Airways, I suspect that's probably South End, um, and that's the last livery that it actually flew in. And then, uh, this is it at Sosterberg when it became a cafeteria. Uh, as I say, there were two others, um, they kept the Channel Airways livery, and, uh, and it was there for several years, and it was I was, I know, a fairly popular sort of roadside cafe, a bit like a motorway service station, I think. Uh, but, but novel, different. And this was uh, AGRU when, when she was bought by BA and taken to Colstead. Um, I say the colour scheme is wrong, uh, they put the white uh, top on. In fact, our Viking is a Mark 1A, uh, and the white top was only ever used on the Mark 1B, so for, for nerds like me, it's kind of slightly inaccurate, that scheme. And then, in 1991, it came to Brooklands, and uh, the people that bought it here decided to paint it in grey, completely, a very light grey. Uh, and you can see, this is a picture of it, on its uh, shortly after arriving at Brooklands. Although the fuselage came to Brooklands, the actual wings went to Heathrow, for a reason I'm not really sure of, and they were stored uh, in the BA engineering base for some years, before they were eventually bought here and, and stacked behind the hangar. And I think most of us, or many of us that have been here a long time, will remember the, rings on, the wings on the toast rack behind the hangar, uh, looking in a fairly sorry condition at that time. So, this was 2003, after we started our part of the restoration. As you can see, the grey paint is now gone. Um, it was originally intended that the aircraft would be displayed indoors. Uh, that being the case, we decided that we were going to paint strip it right back to its bare aluminium because that's how it was in its original livery, bare aluminium with just markings on it. So we wanted to replicate that. So we spent forever stripping it back and it was, it was a big job. There was a lot of paint on there. 80% uh, of the paint came off okay, 20% of the paint you had to fight it off at every inch. It, it was hard work and it took a long time paint stripping it back. Um, and, and then we put some livery on, as you can see, but still no wings. Uh, and there, um, in the hangar, there just wasn't room to put the wings on. It was a very crowded hangar, I'm sure some of you will remember at that time. So there she sat. And even that was indoors, as you'll remember the old hangar, when it rained it still got wet anyway, even that was indoors. Um, 2015, it was eventually removed from the hangar. I think this was in early preparation for the, the, the moving of the hangar and the reorganisation of the hangar. And she went outside. Um, getting out of the hangar was really interesting. We couldn't just roll it out. It wasn't in, aligned with the doors of the hangar. And the doors didn't really operate properly at that time and they didn't open fully. So we had to slide it sideways. So we jacked it up and we put the main undercarriage on skates we then put horses attached to the side of the hangar and we slowly winched it sideways to line up with the doors. It was questionable whether the hangar would move and the Viking would stay where it was, but fortunately the hangar slipped over. And um, It took a day, but we got her out and we rolled her out. And, and she sat outside out the front of the old hangar, or where the old hangar was at that time, for some while. This was it in 2000, and I don't know if that's quite correct, but um, taken alongside Brooklyn's again without its, uh, without its wings. 
And this was it shortly after it was removed to the position it's at now, or the aircraft park. Um, and as you can see, by that time, we've taken the engines off. Um, considering it's 77 years old, it's actually in fairly good condition. It's got some corrosion, particularly in the wing spar, but all in all, it's not too bad. But of course, like any aircraft sitting outside, it's a battle to, you know, to keep it like that. And like all of our aircraft, eventually one day it's got to be put away inside if, if we want to preserve it for the long term. So, um, just moving on to the restoration. Um, I've got a list here of the things that we did in the early days. One of the first things that we had to do, like everything in that era, it had a lot of asbestos in it. So one of the very first jobs was uh, asbestos removal. Particularly, a lot of the pipework was lagged in asbestos. So that was probably the first thing we did. Um, the floor, it was a, a very thin plywood floor. Uh, it was only six millimetres thick. In fact, I've seen a letter from Indian Airways, who were one of the early customers, when they wrote to Vickers complaining how thin the floor was and the fact that it bounced up and down when people walked on it. So it was in a poor condition. We took that out and we put a modern aircraft flooring in. Uh, not entirely accurate, but it's very hard wearing. It doesn't rot. It will last a long time. Uh, and we got it for nothing. So that's always a bonus. Um, we started at that time to put some of the, um, the bulkheads back in and some of the walls inside that to, to, to denote the, um, the galley and the toilet and the... Um, um, where the two cabins were divided and, and um, across the uh, cockpit as well. Um, at that time we also wired up the, um, the freight hold. Um, we kept all the original fittings but we put um, halogen, I think halogen bulbs in at that time. These are now going to be replaced with LEDs but all the lighting in the hold is now back. Um, we replaced all the windows as well. They're, they're perspex, and of course they're 77 years old. They're really crazed, and you couldn't see through them. And being a very thorough team, we replaced them three times, didn't we? The first two times we weren't happy with, and um, so the third time we were happy, and it became a bit of a joke amongst our team just how many times we really did that job. That uh, took a fair old while. As I say, I'm, I'm not going to cover every part of the restoration because I'll be here all day, so we'll just pick a few bits and pieces. Um, so the engines, uh, Hercules engines, sleeve valves engines, they're both seized up. Um, we're often asked, could you ever get them running again? You probably could if you spent enough money on them, and I do mean it would be hundreds of thousands, if not millions, to get them running. They haven't run since 1963. Um, we haven't got the expertise to get them running. It probably require Rolls-Royce heritage to, to be able to do that. Um, so uh, our restoration has involved taking them off. Um, and here you can see in the workshop, and it, you can probably see from that picture there, essentially what we've done is just cleaned them up, tidied them up and painted them. A uh, little bit of metal work, particularly the mountings had to be repaired, but we've done that, and as you can see on the right-hand picture, they look pretty good. Uh, the spinners, that's these red things at the front, they had long since gone, so we managed to acquire some spinners off a of Valletta or a Varsity, I can't remember which, and so these are actually Varsity spinners. Uh, and we put them back on, but hey, no one will ever know, and they're, they're almost identical to the, uh, to the Viking spinners. Uh, and this is us putting the engine back on. Uh, frighteningly, six small bolts hold these engines on. Um, I think that's the thing that interests me. When you, uh, you're involved in this sort of thing, it's amazing just how little holds things together. Uh, I mean, the wing is held on with two bolts. Um, you know, and you think, Jesus, two bolts, um, it's holding the wing on, I'm not sure I'd want to fly in this, but clearly it was sufficient. They're big bolts, but even so, two bolts. And again, the, the engines are held on with six bolts, and, and these bolts are probably three-eighths of an inch. They're not, nothing big at all, but um, as one of my team said this morning, jokingly, actually, ours are held on with five bolts, because we can't find the six bolt at the moment. Um, <laughs> So one of them's got six bolts, the other one's got five. But uh, yeah, not too bad. We put those on, each one on in a day. Putting the wings back on was interesting. Eventually, we did get around to putting the wings on. Oh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we were able to tidy those up, clean them up, and paint them whilst they were still in a rack and not attached to the aircraft. Uh, and then we had to put them on. The first one, I think we spent 15 hours in one day putting it on. It was one hell of a job to get them back on. There's a knack to putting a Viking wing on that we didn't know at the time. However, by the time we'd done the first wing, we'd learnt what the knack was, and the second wing we put on in a, in a few hours. It also helps if you have a crane, which we didn't have for the first one. 
so we got the second wing on much more quickly. But you probably some of you will remember for about two years it sat there with one wing on. Uh, and we always used to, people when asked, which is your aircraft, or just go out there and look for the aircraft with one wing and you've found it. So it was, it was fairly distinctive. Um, this was our lockdown project. Um, we decided the, the elevators, um, which are the, the bits that move at the back that control the, uh, the, uh, the yaw, the pitch of the aircraft, uh, are actually fabric covered, a leftover from the 30s. Um, they were in very poor condition, so uh, our, our lockdown project was we bought the elevators from the museum, and in fact this is my house, uh, luckily I've got a fairly big garage, and, and that's where we worked on them. So we stripped all the old fabric off, um, we, there was a bit of renovation still on the metal work inside, the hinges in particular completely corroded away, so we've made up all new hinges, uh, re repaired the metal work. Uh, painted everything in the interior and then in the middle there is Steve Green who I'm very grateful to who is the museum's resident expert when it comes to putting fabric covering back on an aircraft and you've probably seen although you might not have realised it a couple of our replica aircraft on display he built from scratch so a very clever man indeed so he led the team in terms of uh, re recovering the elevators and this is just a few pictures of us that's the team on the, on the right there working on these um, and that's them complete and the picture on the right hand side is us just putting the elevators back on so that took um, that was good that was a, a learning a, a, le a learning exercise for us and uh, I think for the first go we, it, they came out pretty well I was quite pleased with those the rudder um, was also taken off now we've spray painted the whole aircraft uh, you do get a nice finish when you spray paint it however times have changed policies have changed and we're no longer allowed to spray paint so for the tail cone the elevators which had to be doped as well as spray and the, um, the rudder they were sent to an outside contractor who painted them for us and then when they came back um, it only took a couple of days but we refitted all those parts the great thing about an aircraft of that era is there's nothing too complicated. It's all fairly straightforward and stuff that, uh, with some, a basic toolkit, most of which you, you can work on. It's a bit like a, a car. You lift up a, a bonnet of a modern car, you look inside and you close the bonnet up again. I think, would imagine restoring a modern aircraft would probably be very similar. And this is the interior of the Viking as it is at the moment, as you can see on the, uh, the left-hand picture. There's not much there. Um, it's a bit. Oh, we tidied up before we took that picture. There's a lot of stuff stored in there at the moment. But this is our this is our dream. Um, we'd love to, one day for it to look like that. We're not actually going to do that because that's just too much to achieve. So as, as I said earlier, there is a wing spar that goes right through the middle. It was a mid-winged engine, so there's a wing spar that goes right through the middle of the cabin for those that have never been on the, uh, on the Viking. And the passengers had to climb over the wing spar to get to the forward part of the cabin. The wing spar is probably about two foot high, so they had steps that they used to go over onto the other side. So this effectively created two cabins. So our intention is we are going to restore the forward cabin, forward of the wing spa, where there was just six seats only. So we want to put all the, all the cabin linings back in, the lights, um, the seats, and the tables, and I'll come on to those in a minute, um, so that the, the forward cabin is as it looked in 1946. One of the problems we've had is you can get photographs of the interior at, at that, of that era, but everything's in black and white. So in terms of replicating colours... Um, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, the British Airways Museum have been quite helpful in, in, in that respect, and so I think we're going to get the colours fairly right. Um, and then rear of the uh, spa, we're going to put the lining back on, put the insulation back in, but it's intended that that will be a display area for visitors to come on, a bit like the forward parts of the Viscount that we have. It's, it's open for the public, and it's, the seats are out, and it's a display area. We're probably going to do that. Um, so as has been mentioned earlier we're very grateful to the Finnis family for financing the, um, the manufacture of, of five seats plus the restoration of one original seat as you can see that's the original seat on the uh, left hand side there it was found out in a field uh, in very poor condition although the aluminium was pretty good but certainly all the upholstery had gone uh, another picture in my back garden, because this was another lockdown project, was building these seats. 
Uh, so you can see the original seat is on the right hand side there and the five replicas are on the left hand side. I have to say, I think we've done a pretty good job. They, they, they're very accurate. The only thing we didn't replicate was the mechanism that allows the seat to recline and come up. That was just quite a lot of work and we thought for display purposes we didn't really need that. So otherwise, um, they look very similar. So we've got, if you look at the front, I don't know if you can see it, the seat on your left hand side, sorry, your right hand side is the original. Uh, and the seat on the left hand side is one of the replicas and uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference if you didn't know. Uh, they've all been upholstered um, and they will go back into the aircraft in due course when we reach that stage of the uh, restoration. Um, as I say, um, it had a table in it. Um, it. It was quite luxurious travel for its day and um, this is the former part of the um, the cabin, full of the uh, room star, and as you can see, I have the table uh, there with fold down tables. Now, this table actually belongs to British Airways Museum. Um, I used to work for British Airways and I knew the curator of their museum very well, so he agreed to lend us the table. Uh, we bought it here, we fitted it into the Viking and we photographed it, but more importantly, it allowed us to measure it and take numerous photographs, numerous measurements. So, with the remainder of the Finnis's money, we're going to build two of these tables um, to go back into the Viking. It's a, a two-seater, a wide one, and then there's a smaller table for the left-hand side because it had an offset aisle, so you had one seat on one side, two on the other. So, um, yeah, going forward, we want to build that table and put that back in. Um, tables were optional in the Viking. It depended on what the customer wanted when they bought them. But you can see we just put the seats in place there just to see what it would look like. Uh, these are the seats when they came back from the upholsterer. The man in the middle there is the upholsterer. He actually works for the bus museum uh, and they kindly lent him to us and, and he did the upholstery for us and, and, and did a very good job. And that's one of the seats uh, when it was first upholstered. Right, I'll come back to that in a minute. What I should mention, I mentioned briefly earlier, was the neem powered Viking. Uh, most people, myself included, used to think that the Comet was the first jet-powered passenger aircraft. In fact, it wasn't. The Viking was the first jet-powered passenger aircraft. In 1948, uh, the Ministry of Supply, I think it was, took a Viking, they took off the Hercules engines, and they put uh, Rolls-Royce Neen jet engines on it. Uh, they had to change other things, so for example the elevators, which were fabric covered, had to be replaced with metal covered elevators and uh, a lot of the fabric covering on the ailerons and that had to be replaced and there was other things they needed to do. But it produced an aircraft then that would fly at 384 miles an hour, uh, which is quite an impressive speed for a, for a Viking, so it was double the speed that it was designed to fly at. Uh, and in fact I think in uh, yeah, 1948 they flew it from London to Paris at an average speed of 384 mile an hour. As I say, compared to the normal 190 mile an hour that the aircraft was designed to fly at. Again, I go back to the two bolts holding the wings on when it's flying at that speed. I'd have probably been a nervous passenger. But uh, there you are. Unfortunately, 1954, uh, the Ministry of Supply decided to get rid of it and they took the jet engines out, they put the, the Hercules back on and they sold it to Eagle Airways and it was based at Blackbush. Really sadly, bearing in mind it was the world's very first jet-powered aircraft, Eagle Airways eventually scrapped it and it was buried in a pit in Bedfont near um, Heathrow, which, as far as I'm aware, it's still there to this day. But it would have been nice if somebody had a bit of forethought just to, to preserve it for posterity because it really was uh, a historic aircraft. Anyway, that's, that's the lean-powered um, uh, Viking. The remaining, oh, the, the remaining Vikings, other than ours. Firstly, Argentina have got one in Buenos Aires. It was the Viking 1B. The 1B was 28 inches longer than the 1A, the one that we have. Um, so it got a, an extra row of seats in, slightly bigger. Uh, I don't know too much about that one. AGRW was the one that followed our one down the production line. So that was number 13 off the production line. Um, it was also one of the Vikings that went to Susterberg to become a, a cafe. Um, eventually it went to Vienna, however, uh, and they have done some restoration work, uh, in Vienna it was displayed, uh, it was eventually bought by McDonald's restaurants and they put it outside one of their restaurants where it was a children's play area. As you can imagine, 
uh, there's nothing of the interior left and McDonald's messed around with it a bit. So good luck to the restoration team working on that because there's a lot of work to do on that aircraft. Anyway, they've bought it and um, they've been funded by British Airways to bring it back to the UK and they hope to have it back here by the end of next month or early May at, uh, at the latest. And, and good luck to them and we will be offering whatever help we can in that. Um, Pakistan. The uh, Pakistan Air Force have got a Viking 1B on display. It's an immaculate condition. Of all the Vikings left, this is the best one. Uh, you can go online on YouTube and you can do a virtual tour of the interior of their Viking if you want to. Really good. I'd love to get out there one day and have a look at it, but it's, it's pristine. It really is in good condition. And it's stored inside, which is really good. Uh, Switzerland, AIVG. This crashed. It was in BEA service. It crashed in 1953 at Le Bourget. Um, it sat there for many, many years. They just put it on the side of the uh, airfield and it sat there for many years until um, the Schlumpf brothers, I think I pronounced that correctly, or something similar, they bought it to put in a museum at Malouse. They delivered it to Malouse but really did nothing with it. It just sat uh, in a shed. Um, I visited that in 1999 along with uh, Dave Gilmore, one of, one of the colleagues off the team, and we were able to take a couple of fabric samples from that, so, so we are able to replicate those colours when we come to put the fabric back on in, in the interior of ours. Uh, that's up for sale if anybody wants it. Um, I'd love for Brooklyn's to buy it, but I don't think it's going to happen. But hey, we could have a fleet of them if we had, if we had two. Uh, probably that would be a very good restoration product because... Um, all the interior is complete, everything is there inside, so it's um, not so good on the outside, but it's got all its internal fittings. And the last one is stored down in um, South Africa, in Johannesburg. For many years, and you can see pictures online, it sat on the roof of a, a petrol station. They had it on display. Um, fortunately, a, a team were formed to, to restore this, and uh, we speak to them on a fairly regular uh, occasion. And uh, they're, do they're doing a good job. They've certainly completed their cockpit and that's all back together now. And um, we were able to supply them with a, a workshop manual, which they didn't have. And we've got several, so we, we have been able to help those out. And so those are the Vikings that are left. Uh, I mentioned briefly earlier the Valletta. Um, there's only two of those left, uh, both in the UK. One's at Norfolk and Suffolk Aviation Museum and the other one's up at um, Cosford, I believe. Yeah, Cosford is the other. There's only two Valettas left. Um, and, and that's kind of it, I think. Um, I could go on. Oh, my, I love this picture. Um, Vikings parked up at Blackbush uh, in the 50s. That's the way aviation should be. That's the way we should still fly today. I mean, look at the security chain. That division between land side and air side. We're just civilised flying, I always think. But... Um, yeah, our Eagle bought loads of Vikings second hand, mainly from BEA, and, and they operated them in the 50s and into the 60s. And uh, Blackbush was their main base until they were forced to close down due to their proximity at Heathrow in the late 50s. Um, so that's a very, very quick overview of the Viking. I could go on all day because there's a lot to talk about, but I've only got so much time. But any questions? Yes, sir. At the moment, nothing. Um, we've got two seats in there. We've got um, the uh, centre console, but it's not a Viking centre co center console, because if you look at it very carefully, there's one lead that says Bombay Doors. Um, so that's come from uh, a varsity, but it's very, very similar, and it's all we've got, so eventually that will be restored. We are told, and though none of us have ever seen it, I think we, we do have the instruments, but they're in the radiation store at the moment. So... Um, yeah, we're just turning our attention from the interior now, so we will restore the cockpit as best we can, and some of it remains, but probably not all of it. We could all thank Bill for a fantastic talk, and if people want to ask you questions, ask <laughs>